Good evening, I'm Pat Sherry. Thank you all for joining Darien Library and Paige Knox this evening for Jasper John's Mind Over Matter, currently at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Uh, Jasper John's groundbreaking work sent shockwaves through the art world when it was first shown in the 1950s. And he's continued to challenge new audiences and himself over a career spanning more than 65 years. He was born in 1930 in Augusta, Georgia, and today lives in Sharon, Connecticut, where at the age of 91, he remains active in his studio. Jasper John's Mind Mirror is the most comprehensive retrospective ever devoted to his work. In an unprecedented collaboration, this major exhibition is jointly organized by the Whitney Museum of American Art and the Philadelphia Museum. Featuring his most iconic works, along with many others shown for the first time, it comprises a broad range of paintings, drawings, prints, and sculptures from 1954 to today on both sites. Paige Knox is an adjunct professor in art history department of Columbia University. In addition to her teaching, she works in a variety of capacities at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, giving public gallery talks and lectures and special exhibitions, as well as a permanent collection, teaching classes, and leading groups for travel with the Met. And now if you're ready to explore this unprecedented exhibit, I'll hand the mic over to Paige. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. And I'm thrilled to be here. And uh, I wanted, I said this to Pat before we got on, but I want to kind of underscore that what I'm gonna do tonight is not to take you in a virtual tour through the show. Um, I think you can do that First of all, I think you should go to the show. Uh, but what I want to really do is introduce concepts and introduce ideas. And the show, as Pat mentioned, is enormous. It actually takes place in two venues. Half of it's at the Whitney. Half of it is at the Philadelphia Art Museum. And it encompasses an enormous amount of Johns' work. But one of the things that I find so intriguing about Johns is that he starts out, he lays out a couple of very important themes, a couple of very important ideas. And the rest of his career will basically continually re-engage with these concepts, with these objects, with these forms. And so what I wanna do tonight is, first of all, prepare you for the show. And I, I also, I've been teaching John, he's, believe it or not, it's my final exam for my students. So um, I actually am going to want you to think about John's and I'm going to be popping up sort of questions on the screen, not to ask you to answer them, but to make you think about larger um, ideas because John's is arguably one of the most cerebral artists uh, alive today. And I think he's very playful. He's very enigmatic. It's one of the things I love so much about him is on the one hand, his work looks very obvious. It's about flags and targets and maps and things that you see every day. And yet he's also someone that in this um, real deep, thoughtful manner makes us look very closely at the world around us. And he starts working, as Pat mentioned, in the 50s taking objects that you see you know, around you um, and also very much engaging in what's on, what is, is au courant in the 50s, which is abstract expressionism. And he's basically in his early work, that's what he pushes against these great artists like Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko and de Kooning. Those are really the people who are sort of in the, you know, in, in the mind's eye, they are the American artists. And he's gonna push against those individuals. Uh, he makes very, very, I think the pieces are very nuanced. They speak about his own biography. They speak about philosophies of life. They speak about semiotics. They speak about perception. They speak about color theory. And you can, and hopefully tonight, we're gonna to go down some of those roads and explore those elements. He also truly impacts almost every major movement that comes uh, after his time. He certainly impacts pop and the engagement with commercial culture. He impacts conceptual art. He very much has a statement in postmodernism and performance art. And I think his engaging with the everyday objects that we might call found objects, 
really erasing divisions between what is high art, fine art, and low art mass culture really paves the road for Andy Warhol. Uh, now, he's very aware about his art history, and that's one of the other things that I love about John's. And he engages in a lot of ideas about modernism that are put out there by Clement Greenberg, who is the great um, figure of the sort of the mouthpiece of the abstract expressions, but he's also engaged in popular culture. And he runs the gamut of a lot of ideas about modernism. He engages in this idea of modernism, but he also subverts it. And he just loves ambiguity. It's one of the things that I find so powerful about him. Um, he learned a great deal from Marcel Duchamp. Um, and I think he wants to kind of bring you as the viewer into this play, this word play, this conceptual play. And that's what I'm gonna to try to hopefully do tonight. Now, Johns is often um, recognized for his most um, iconic quote. And you'll see this when you walk into the exhibition in the second gallery, which is devoted to the flag paintings. And this was the quote, one night I dreamed I painted a large American flag. And the next morning I got up and I went out and I bought the materials to begin it pretty straightforward, right, in that sense. But the idea is that he has this vision and then he realizes the vision. Um, and this flag, he's, the flag is really John's most iconic piece, I would argue. He makes over 30 images of the flag, wide variations in multimedia. He does them, um, you know, plays around with the flag's color. He plays around with the flag's shape. He plays around with the flag's form. But the original flag, the first one that he made, was made um, from, and it's also very important to be aware of the materials because Johns loves to make things with his hands. He's very engaged in that idea of making. Uh, so it's made of oil encaustic. If you look at the, in, the, 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 the materials, encaustic oil and collage on fabric mounted on plywood three panels. And it's important, this you can see in the show if you go, that there's a panel here, there's a panel here, and then there's a panel here. It doesn't really translate terribly well on the screen, but you can see that. And I think more than anything, he wants you to look at this flag, look at it closely and think about all of what is embedded in this flag. What does this flag mean? And what does it mean to you? Now, most people I think would argue it's a symbol of the United States. And when you see this, you feel very patriotic, you're an American, you're proud to be an American. But the work, I think, also leads you to think about the flag differently. Just in terms of the materials, it leads you to look at it differently. This use of wax and encaustic. It makes you look at the fact that there are stripes, that some are red and some are white, that there are is a blue background with white stars. Now, this may sound pretty basic, but I don't think we stop and look at the flag in this way thinking about, you know, what does it mean? And, and, and it's interesting because, you know, how was the, this, this flag originally constructed? How, did, how does he put it all together? So instead of seeing it just as a flag, you're investigating it as a shape, as an object, as a thing, as a work of art that consists of colors and composition and form. So once you've sort of engaged with that, then I think he wants you to rethink uh, you know, an object that you see all the time and that you say, I think many people would say this is a timeless image, right? Um, is, it, is it a timeless image or is it an image of its time, right? We don't really, I think, think about that, but I think if you look at this, you might not notice that there are only 48 stars in this flag, in the original, because at that point we didn't have Alaska and Hawaii. So I think people don't realize that the flag changes over time, its actual form. Um, I think it's also very important to remember that when he makes this image in 1955, we're in a particular era, we're in an era of the Cold War, and there's a lot of concern over communism, and people are being flagged as communists. So there's a concern over national pride, national freedom. And again, to many people, this is the ultimate symbol of freedom. To some other people, it's the ultimate symbol of oppression. So it's an image that speaks, I think in 1955 to a time where people thought about the flag in one way. Um, and since that time, 
since the, particularly the 1960s, when people started to use flags and wear them and, you know, put them on their blue jeans and put them on their sneakers. And, and now we don't really think twice about that. But back in the 1950s, I think that people were less that would certainly raise eyebrows. And I think also when you get into then the changing times of the 70s, how did the production of the flag, was it impacted by people who protested, who, who burned the flag, who were not aware of, you know, did not respect it in that way. So there's a lot of loaded ideas about this flag and the, particularly the fact that it's made in 1955. Um, now, again, the question, and this was posed to Johns, is this a painted flag or a flag painting? In other words, is this a flag, an object, a flag, or is it a painting of a flag? And, you know, how did those two things differ? Uh, and Johns actually thought they were both. He said that the flag was a fact. Now, I personally think this is a painting of a flag, because if you know the flag, the flag actually has very specific restrictions and regulations about how it's manufactured, how it's produced. And you look closely, you'll realize that the white stripes of the actual flag um, are much a pure, more of a pure white than the white that is created here with the encaustic. So it's, it's interesting, you know, kind of thinking about the flag in different ways. Um, but I think the flag for me is more of an idea than a fact, the idea of America and what it means to be an American. And that's also another very loaded question. You know, what does it mean to be an American? And I think all these things, the more you talk about the flag, you don't think about these things when you look at the flag flagging on the flagpole, right? Um, and again, you know, I, I think different people, depending whether you're a US citizen or not, you also might have a different opinion of what this symbolizes and what it means, right? Um, now, one of the interesting things um, that it's also interesting is he's thinking about style and thinking about how he wants to create a sense of expression. So rather than having a flag that is, again, a, a manufactured flag, he's showing you a sense of painting, he's showing you a sense of the hand of the artist that's in here. And of course, you can see it um, if you look closely and you can get the sense of his engagement with the wax and the wax process. Um, he says, I'm interested in the idea of sight and the use of the eye. I'm interested in how we see and why we see the way we do. And again, I think that's part of what he's trying to bring in. And one of the other things that you know people would say, well, why is this flag in a museum? The flag should be flying in a flagpole outside of the museum of the Whitney. Why is it on the wall? And that really gets back again to his relationship with Dada and with Marcel Duchamp. And Marcel Duchamp is kind of the grandfather of the found object. You may be familiar with the urinal. And he basically said, well, you know, this is art. This is on the walls of the men because I say so, right? So um, it's, it's, again, I think, they're both very contested objects in some ways, urinal versus a flag, but they take common everyday objects and they make you rethink this. And as I said, this is really prefiguring Warhol, um, who also kind of gets into the whole issue of common property as well. Now, when you look at this flag, you can see the one, um, the one that's at the Whitney, then they're all, most of these that those these two flags are in the exhibition. Um, but the Whitney flag, the one that the, that museum owns versus MoMA, I think calls attention to itself much more as an art object. There's the design, there's the composition, there are the stars, and they're repeated in this three dimensional way. It's actually a flat canvas, although it looks like there would be a flag on top of a flag on top of a flag. Um, but again, I think by, by, by juxtaposing these flags, he's making you think again about the fact that you don't look that closely at the flag. And when you walk into this gallery in the, in the exhibition, you start to see all of these different flags. And I think it's a good question. Which, which flag do you prefer? Which one is more powerful? Which one looks more like a work of art? Which one looks more like a flag? Which one raises all these questions that he wants to ask? And then he starts really kind of, again, playfully engaging in larger um, it changes of the flag. And this one, this is the white flag. This is the Mets flag. Um, and this is actually a moment where he removes the color 
and you really focus on the form. It fo makes you focus on the three panels, the stripes, the stars, and you look at it removing the color. Now, people have, um, you know, and particularly look very much at the wax of this. Uh, and so it engages you in a more, I think, visceral way. One of the interesting things was he used this wax. Um, it was a technique that he actually learned going to the Met. Um, it was a technique that goes back a couple thousand years when the Romans start to um, occupy Egypt. And you see this conflation of two different cultures, the mummies of Egypt and then the more naturalistic portraiture of Rome. And what, what these Romans did was actually to create portraits and then using this encaustic wax, they made it permanent on top of the mummies. And that's the method that he's using. And some people actually say that he's suggesting that, you know, he's moving on using wax, but some people have actually said he's thinking that the old Abex artists are a bunch of mummies, like they belong in the museum that he's now engaging in something really creative. The other thing that I think is really interesting, people at all, we used to talk about this, um, the white flag, you know, is this an image about race in America? And I um, used to argue, no, I always thought it was really more about form. Uh, but I think now um, I have, a, I can't really look at this without thinking about the issues of whether, you know, the, the idea that this is a white flag. And, and I think, again, it raises those questions. Now, when you go into this room in flags, well, flags you're gonna see how John's plays around with different backgrounds and different colors. Um, and of course, in this case, to make a background of the red, white, and blue flag, he can't use red, white, or blue. So he uses orange kind of as a way to make you see the flag in another way. And again, he's making, you know, this is 1957. Um, and then in 1986, he's redoing it. Now, hopefully, because you're looking at flags and you're looking closely at flags at this moment, you'll note now that we've gone from 48 states to 50 states. So we now have a new reconfiguring of the flag. So he's renewing the image while holding on to um, earlier ways of, 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 of you know, that he was thinking about the flag. Now, I think also he moves in a direction that's almost entirely abstract. And I would argue that if I hadn't been sitting here talking to you about all these flags and you just looked at this image and you're gonna see some of these in the show that you wouldn't think that this was a flag, that you would think this is an abstract painting, that he's being, you know, an abstract expressionist in a way. So he's using this flag now as a way to kind of, come up with different types of styles to in, in, engage and embrace. And again, making the flag now a gray, neutral color. Um, uh, and again, people would wonder, is this disrespectful to the American flag? Is what John's doing something that is, um, is does he push the boundaries? Because technically, as we know, there are laws about the flag. You have to fold the flag a certain way. You have to maintain the flag in certain places. Um, and so the fact that he's making a painting of a flag, this is where I believe it's not the flag, it's a work about the flag. He's able to do this and we don't, we, we don't see it as, as, as disrespectful. Um, also, one of the things you're gonna notice when you walk into the show, the opening gallery is this enormous wall with all kinds of works on paper that deal with flags and targets and numbers and maps, all the things I'm gonna be talking about because he was really a quite exceptional, he was quite exceptional in his printing techniques and his works on paper. And it's a very, very important part of his process. And again, using these same themes in different media, but he turns, what he does now is he turns his traditional horizontal flag vertical and he bends back the sheet of paper. So you know that it is in fact, a, a almost like the flag kind of blowing in the wind in a way. Um, and of course it mimics a real flag hanging vertically, flapping and flowing in the wind, but makes it a tangible thing. So he's repositioning the flag, flag as he flips it around. So kind of using 
um, works on paper to achieve um, some other kind of interesting ideas about the flag. Now, this is, I think, one of his saddest flags. Um, and this is called In Memory of My Feelings. This one is not, this is, I believe, in Philadelphia. I don't think this is in, um, in the Whitney. Uh, and it, it, it's about, it's basically made in honor of Frank O'Hara. Frank O'Hara was um, a very close friend of a lot of the artists in the 50s and 60s. He was a curator at MoMA and he was also a poet. And he wrote in very terse, very direct style of poetry. Uh, very pared down, kind of like a Ernest Hemingway. And the poems were deceptively simple, but they captured a lot of emotions. And I think in some ways that's very emblematic of John's as well. The work looks really deceptively simple, but it's much more complex. And this is actually made at a time, and I'm gonna get into this a little bit more, at the time that John's breaks up with Robert Rauschenberg. And um, everything, you know, it's a relationship that was so critical. They were so close to each other. Um, it was a relationship that they kept very quiet. Only friends, intimate friends knew that this was going on, but the breakup was really brutal. And I, now the flag is dark and the stars are gone. They're hidden behind a cupboard, if you will. Um, and the spoon and the fork, you know, they're, they're, they're together, but they're sort of hanging by a thread. So it's a very sad um, image. And down here you see in memory of my feelings. So it is a very autobiographical image in that way um, that, that, that kind of captures some of the sadness that he's experiencing. And, and if you actually um, read the poem, um, you can see that the poem speaks to, um, Frank O'Hara says, my quietness has a number of naked selves. And that's kind of really captures John's personality in, in an interesting way. He's very shy, kind of the quiet one, whereas Rauschenberg was the gregarious one. He was very quiet in that sense. Uh, now there's another wonderful object that's in the show, the ale cans. And this is um, really all about the relationship between Johns and Rauschenberg and Leo Castelli. Uh, Leo Castelli, and there are many different stories. I actually, the one I like about how Castelli discovers Johns via Rauschenberg is the one that um, apparently uh, Rauschenberg had um, had a relationship with Castelli. Castelli is the main dealer of this time period. He's working with all the up and coming artists and he has a great relationship with a lot of important figures in the art world. And uh, he, um, again, he had seen Rauschenberg's work and was showing Rauschenberg's work and Rauschenberg invites him over for a drink. Johns is living right below Rauschenberg and uh, Castelli gets to Rauschenberg's apartment and it's, he's brushing versus oh I don't have any ice my neighbor downstairs has ice let's go let's go get some ice from him and you know this has all been sort of arranged ahead of time and Johns is there and Costelli walks in and sees Johns's studio and he's absolutely just blown away by everything that he sees and then he brings in um brings in Johns to be uh you know have shown his gallery um and this is actually um a joke that was made between de Kooning and Costelli because de Kooning said oh my gosh Leo Costelli you are such uh, an incredible talent as a dealer you could sell anything you could two, sell two cans of beer so Jasper John sort of takes up the challenge of this and Castelli will then go on to be his main, main dealer in that way. And at the show that Johns has with Castelli, Alfred Barr will come in and he will buy three works. So it's Castelli's the dealer for the rest of Castelli's life. He, he will use other dealers as well, but very, very important. And he makes these, these cans. Um, this is Castelli with Johns. This is Castelli with de Kooning, kind of making these jokes. And here you see them later on, but they had a very long lasting and very important relationship. Now, some people say, and I don't really know if I buy into this, that it's also um, an emblem of the relationship between Rauschenberg and Johns, that Rauschenberg sort of would be the beer can on the left that's open, that's bright, that's sort of cheerful. And then the other piece on the right being Johns, which is a little bit more closed, a little less vibrant um, in that way. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, you can sort of 
the open versus closed, reserved and philosophical and inward versus kind of gregarious. And, and, and Rauschenberg was always the life of the party. Um, we don't know, uh, but it's an interesting thing. Some people think it's about the past and the future, um, but what I do think is interesting is how, again, it paves the way for um, Warhol and Warhol appropriating commercial brands and recognizable um, products and then recreating them as such. But I would argue that they're quite different in the sense that John still holds on to this concept of sculpture. This is a sculpture. It's a bronze piece that's been cast to look like beer cans, right? Whereas, yes, Warhol is actually, it's a stencil, but I think in some ways, Warhol, it's a little bit more direct in terms of its relationship with the mass produced good, this mass produced soup. Whereas the ale cans are still more sculptural, they're more artistic in that way. But I do um, love, and this is also in the show, this, this the Samarin coffee can. Um, and I, I, I like this, this quote of John's, take an object, do something to it, do something else to it. You know, take these objects, these found objects and play with them in some wonderful ways. Now, when you come into the gallery, first, that first gallery that's filled with all of the works on paper that relate to all these different, these different objects. Then the second gallery is a very large gallery that deals primarily with the flags and the maps, big, large paintings and sort of sets the tone for a lot of things you can see. And then you move into the third gallery, which is about his, I think, biography. And you see a lot of wonderful photographs. And I've just tried to put a few of them here. Um, my personal favorite is the one, um, this one, which is uh, Abaddon, because he's so happy and smiling, um, young, bright future ahead of him. But he has a very complicated childhood. Um, as Pat mentioned, he was born in 1930 in Augusta, Georgia. Um, and he's named after Jasper Johns, who was actually a sergeant in the Revolutionary War. There's a statue of him down, I believe, in and somewhere in, I think it's in South Carolina, I'm not sure. But in any case, um, he grows up in rural South Carolina and his parents divorce at the age of two, when he's two years old. And neither one of pet mother or father wants him. So he gets sent to live with his grandfather. And uh, his grandmother is an artist. She has art on the wall in a pretty basic way. Uh, but that's what he gets exposed to. And he lives with them until he's nine years old. And then he moves in with an aunt who actually teaches a one in a one room schoolhouse, which I think is really crazy. So he literally, that's his early education. He moves from one bench to the next as he makes his way up. Uh, and then he attends high school. And that's the moment that he reunites with his mother. But it's a pretty lonely childhood. Um, and then when he goes to high school, he goes to, he gets a scholarship to go to South Carolina, um, University of South Carolina to study art. Uh, and the teachers really want him to go to Parsons. They want him to go to New York. He is a little bit hesitant about that, but he does get drafted into the army, goes to, um, to Japan, and he is um, in South Korea, and then he basically is honorably discharged from the army, and that's when he comes to New York City, and that's when he meets Robert Rauschenberg, and the two of them just, they, they are, it's a very important relationship. They're, I said, they're kind of like Brock and Picasso. Um, they're, they kind of gave each other permission to experiment. They were doing things. And I would also argue, and I mean, the show shows you this enormous body of work, um, but the, the real, the seeds of everything come out of this relationship. Um, all the ideas kind of brew at this time that they are together. And um, I think that they, they were each other's audience. You know, they critiqued, they talked, they played, they laughed, they cried, they did all those things together. And both of them were very interested in collage. And both of them were very interested in pushing back against the abstract expressions. They wanted to do something, something new, right? So this is when he has, it's when he's with, with, with Rauschenberg that he has the dream about the flag. Um, and then we turn next to the targets. So I was asked the question, like, what is a target? What's the purpose of a target, right? 
Well, if you think about it, a target is really made to frame your vision. It's made for you, um, something that's usually put far away to help you shoot at, or you know, whether it's a gun or a bow and arrow, but it's a way to make you focus, right? Focus your vision. So it's intended to make you look closely and yet a target, a normal target is usually far away, right? So if you're looking at this from close up in a museum, you start to kind of think about it, not just as a target, but also as a work of art. Again, is it a target or is it a painting of a target? And I would argue it's a painting of a target. And once you realize that, you start thinking about it and you say, oh, look, it's got colors, it's got the primary colors, red, yellow, blue. And you kind of think about how those colors sort of interact and impact the way you focus. And you are supposed to focus on the bullseye, right? That's, the, that's what you're intended to focus on. But then once you start looking at this and you get close and you wanna to touch it, and again, it's made of that encaustic, that same wax. Um, and you start to look at the different things that are above it. And I would argue in some ways, this is kind of like a shooting gallery, you know, where you go and the, the different boxes open and you see all these different body parts. Um, so it's very sort of strange, like, you know, you might shoot at uh, some of these body parts in a way. Um, and so it, it's, 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 it's making you think about the purpose of, of a target, the purpose of looking, the purpose of sort of organizing your, your, your vision, if you will. Now he goes from there to creating, and this is also in the exhibition. This is the very iconic target with faces that's at, the, that's at MoMA. Um, and you'll notice it's still made of encaustic on newspaper and cloth over canvas, but surmounted by four tinted plaster faces with a hinge front. So this actually flap comes down over the faces. But what's very strange, and I, again, when you first look at this, you focus on the target and then kind of it, you, you're in a museum, so you look a little closer and then you look up and you see these faces. But what's very strange is there are no eyes in these sculptures. So it's, they're depersonified. It's not a, a, of an individual. They kind of just become anonymous. And I think what's so interesting here, and it is both a painting and a sculpture in that way, um, but I think he's also painting this in the 50s and thinking about people who are targeted. And of course, you know, we're at this time again, the communist era where people are being targeted, they're being blacklisted, they're being recognized as communists, as enemies of the state. But I also think um, that when you contemplate this moment, this is kind of, I always use the example of Mad Men with my students, um, you are being targeted by advertisers. If you ever watch that Mad Men show, you know, they, they don't know who the consumer is, but they know that they like this kind of beer or they drink, they smoke this kind of cigarette. And so they're going to create ads that are targeting particular groups, particular people. And so you, in a sense, become a target in this new commercial world. So it's a very interesting way of thinking about these things. Now, as I mentioned, Rauschenberg is also in very involved in these found objects and kind of wandering around New York City and combining all these objects. And you can actually see that he overtly references um, John's flag in here. And then he makes these things that are opening and closing and John's is making these. So, so they're, as I said, you know, they're bouncing these ideas back and forth about, you know, what's a found object, what's a piece of sculpture, what's a target, um, you know, sort of, and, and also I should add too, if you, the FBI is also quite prevalent and the FBI targets are kind of very well-known things, but essentially what, um, what John is really doing here, as I said, he want to push against these abstract expressionist artists and particularly critiquing um, Clement Greenberg, who is sort of the mouthpiece of these ABEX artists thinking about modern art. And Greenberg's, one of his things that we always talk about this in my classroom is that Greenberg says, well, a work of art is an object. It's a thing in and of itself. It doesn't represent anything else. And that is what is crucial to it. And so Johns is actually critiquing that and saying, okay, I'm making a work of art. It certainly is a recognizable thing. 
um, that, that, you know, it, 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 it does reference targets, but it's also an object in and of itself. So he's, he's, he's playing around, very ambiguous. Again, it's the, the joy of John's, you can really kind of go down the rabbit hole. I mean, one of the things that Clement Greenberg always said was the painting of the abstract expressions call attention to their surface. They call attention to the fact that this is not a window onto the world, it's not a mirror, it's a flat canvas with paint on it. And, and, and John's is saying, well, look, my, my canvas does that. My canvas calls attention to the surface with the encaustic. And Clement Greenberg really did not care for John's. He really found his work to be quite annoying in a sense, because again, it engages with this popular culture and Greenberg's abstract expressions were, you know, in their garrets painting works about existence. And, you know, he doesn't want to sort of move in this direction. And yet there's a lot of interesting overlap in that. Now, one of the things that he starts doing, which is quite fascinating, you see a lot of these in the show, he starts to take the traditional color the, the, the opposing colors where it's black and white or red, yellow, and blue out of the target. So that the target basically becomes one color. And essentially by doing that, the target loses its function because it's the oppositional, it's the different colors that allow you to zoom in on the bullseye, right? That's what, that's what does it. So he actually takes it, you know, he great, take this, take this green target, put it out in your yard and try to hit the bullseye. It's very hard because you can't see it. So again, it sort of takes the whole, you know, he, he's playing around with the idea that it is a target, but it also looks like an abstract painting at the same time. And most of these, you know, if you think about our archery targets, they're set up to be outside. Um, and you put this outside and it's not very helpful, right? So it's really almost working in opposition to the target. And then he starts playing around using, you know, you can start to see the materials and the newspaper that go into the wax. Um, and, you know, really playing around with it to a point where he goes to the white target. And this is again, you know, it's kind of an oxymoron. Like, what's the point of having a white target? You won't, you, you won't be, it won't, it won't help you focus. You can't see the bullseye, right? So it's, it's very interesting in, in thinking about that. Um, and Leo Steinberg, I love this. He says he's written great great, a lot of great pieces on John's. He said, John's is working as if he's producing a painting for a blind man. And I think that's, I think that's good. And the surface of this painting, once you think about blind man, when you want to touch it, when you go and you see these paintings, they're very textured. There's really a great desire to sort of see this. Um, and this was also responding to Rauschenberg, who had created his first white paintings at Black Mountain College, which were a collaborative effort. Everybody kind of came in and painted a little um, you know, that was the whole idea. He started this white painting and then, you know, Cy Twombly would come in and he would paint some white and then Annie Albers would come in and she would paint some white and it was just a collaborative effort. So he's, he's thinking about what uh, he's learning from Rauschenberg. And then again, going into different media lithographs. As I said, when you walk in that first room, you'll see a lot of these targets. This is actually my favorite of the targets in some way. Um, it was made in 15 years later and it's a kit and it comes in a wooden box that you close up and it has an ink stamp. It has um, dry watercolor cakes. And basically what Jasper Johns invites you to do is make your own target. So he's created this this kit and then he asks the viewer to add to it to basically take the brush you know use the watercolor and to basically finish the the colors as you wish but essentially this work remains unfinished because if you actually do finish it basically what you do is you ruin the value of it so he says, target 1970, Jasper Johns and. So in other words, Paige Knox brings up, picks up the brush, color, you know, gets the colors and paints it in and signs her name. Well, what, what have I done to it? I have basically devalued it. It's worth a lot less if it's also, if, if Paige Knox signs her name to it and adds her hand to it. Now, it maybe if, you know, Beyonce does this, maybe it's worth more, but generally speaking, he's really playing around. You know, he's, he's authorizing you to finish it. 
He's leaving it incomplete. He's putting it out there. But the paradox is if you touch it, you ruin it, right? So, you know, again, he's challenging these questions in the art world about originality, about uniqueness, about authorship. And then, you know, who, who's a valued co-author of my work and why? It's very, very, again, really interesting stuff in that way. Uh, now we get into um, this whole engagement with language. And as I said, these paintings look very colorful and fun, but they're very much engaging with some pretty cerebral stuff, with semiotics, um, with the idea of linguistics. You know, if you, uh, Roland Barthes was the great writer about arbitrariness of language. And during, you know, um, it was very much a part of sort of academic, uh, discussions about these paintings to think about Saussure and Levi Strauss and all of these different, you know, very sort of high minded people writing about signs and symbols. But what he's really doing is he's taking a stencil and he's using the stencil, which is a, a, a prefab, a pre made um, object that allows you to make letters and fonts that are sort of uniform um, and to take those letters and put them together in different configurations to make words. So there, the, the letter is a recognizable symbol. And then when the letter is combined with other letters, it creates a word, which then means something else. But what he wants to talk about is the arbitrariness of language, which a lot of people were engaging with. So what does he do? He will, and this is something that, that Picasso was also very much engaged with. Um, so the stencils provide, again, an arbitrary, a very uniform way of creating a word. So for example, he will, you know, try to um, explain the word yellow to someone. The only way, and this is the arbitrariness of language, the only way that you can explain yellow to someone is by attaching it to an object. The sun is yellow, the flower is yellow. Um, it's very hard to explain yellow in and of itself. So what does Johns do? He writes the word yellow, paints the stencil in blue and puts it on top of yellow. Or in other cases, he takes the word red, writes it in, makes the stencil in red and puts it on white. And then sometimes he'll put orange in white and put it on red. So he's playing around with all of these different ideas, but he's also, engaging in this very, this idea we call factor, which is the, the paint is very thick. It's very, um, it's placed on the canvas with great sense of brushwork. And that's very much of an abstract expressionist style, right, brushwork. But he's including language that references particular things, which is completely counter to what abstract expressionism is all about. So again, kind of this, this tension, he, the stencil gets rid of the hand, right? And yet the brushwork makes it very hands-on. So he's kind of playing around with all of these things. And he does this, and there's a whole room with these, these engagement with the idea of the arbitrariness of language. And he does it with lithographs, paintings, um, all these different ideas about chance, how certain things can appear and you know, taking advantage of chance. I mean, it's again, it's very, very cerebral stuff. So what he's doing here, again, thinking about foundational stuff going forward, he's laying the foundations for conceptual art and artists, people like Joseph Pesuth that going forward will work um, in, with ideas that are all about language. And you, you now you see a lot of art, like Barbara Kruber is very involved in language and um, you know, what does a word mean and how does the word look? And, is it so arbitrary its definition? And so, you know, he's, he's engaging with this whole concept about conceptual use of language in works that look very simple, right? Colors with names of colors written on them. And yet, as I said, if you want, you can really, you know, you, could, you can really take this in some very intellectual directions. And that out of that idea about arbitrariness of language and color, comes the maps and the maps play into all of these ideas. So for example, when I say California, I would argue that you see the word California and you know the shape of California, um, 
And yet you associate things with California, you associate California with LA or, you know, that kind of, you know, cool California. Or I say the word Texas, and you know the shape of Texas, and you know the word Texas, but you also have these associations with Texas. But what I think he's saying is that, you know, these states, they're very arbitrary, these shapes. Who, who decided that the border of Texas was, I mean, uh, granted, the Rio Grande is one border that's a natural border. Who decides where these borders are and how these shapes are created? So in many ways, the shapes of the states are as arbitrary as the names of the states. So again, you know, he's sort of playing around with how familiar you are with this map of the United States and yet how arbitrary aspects are of it. So, you know, why, why when you step one foot in one place, you're in Kansas and one foot in another, and you know, you're, you're in Oklahoma. So, you know, how does that work? So he's playing around with that. But the paintings, you know, really also sort of make you kind of think about the United States. And again, like the flag, it's an image that we all know. And yet how often do you really think about the form, the forms of all these states, the forms and what, what does it mean that all of these states, I mean, not all here, but you know, that they're all put together, right? And I also do like the idea that he kind of puts American painting on the map. I think that's kind of a nice idea. Um, now he'll do the same thing with numbers. And again, the number is the same thing like the letter, like the word uh, yellow or blue. It doesn't mean anything until you attach it to something. So for example, the number one, um, it can mean you're number one, you know, you're, you're on top, you're the best. Or if you're evaluating something from one to 10, well, then you're the lowest. So you need to know the context of the number. So the number in and of itself is a completely arbitrary abstract concept. And yet we recognize the shapes that, rec that suggest to us numbers. And so I would argue that what this painting encourages you to do is look at the painting and find the number one. You see, the, oh, I see the number two, I see the number three. But what you, you can't do is see all the numbers at the same time. At least I can't. And so again, he's kind of thinking about that, that you look for these numbers and that, you know, numbers are abstract and yet they have form at the same time. So it's a very, very, again, cerebral concept in, in that way. Um, and of course, you know, in that way, also numbers, these big numbers, we recognize them as symbols, but there's also a lot of abstract expression in the way that these are painted. I think they're beautiful paintings and I love the way in which he brings out the colors and, you know, I, I, I find them aesthetically in incredibly pleasing, but I also love what he's doing in terms of making you think about all these conceptual ideas. Now he expands this into the grid. So thinking about more numbers, right? Numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. So this is this grid that kind of goes in both directions. And then you can have all these relationships between the threes and the fours and the fives. And if you want to stand here, you can stand here for hours and find all the eights and look at how the nines relate to the threes and how things move when you shift the numbers around. Or you can just fully appreciate the forms and the, the, the color and this brush stroke. So there are lots of different ways to really think about it. And of course, he's using the grid, which becomes something really crucial in minimalist art. Think of people like Agnes Martin, Saul DeWitt, all these conceptual artists and minimalists who use numerical relationships as something that's really crucial to their work. And you can see that in here, or you can basically just see it as, you know, something that, 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 that kind of, moves in, in, in different directions. Now, um, and I, these are really all the kind of things that you're gonna see in the show. These are all the kind of things that really engage, that he engages with and sort of set the tone for a lot of ideas. So I do also wanna show you after um, one other sort of type of painting that incorporates a lot of these, and these are the device paintings. And these paintings show you, again, the making of these works. They often have a device that's attached and the device often operates kind of like a squeegee. 
So it's a very interesting way of thinking about how paint can be moved and manipulated. And if you think about that too, that's Gerhard Richter. So he's kind of engaging in that. And you can see how these device paintings, this is actually him working on an image called Diver. And um, Diver, you'll see in the show, Diver um, referenced a friend of his who was a diver who passed away when he was diving. Um, and so there's a lot of biographical elements in the images of Diver. Um, and then also you can see these device paintings start to incorporate a lot of the numbers, a lot of the letters. You can see the actual device and then the word device. So it's kind of bringing all of this to bear. And this is another example of using a device, but in this particular case, the device is a broom, right? So he's taking the broom and he identifies it as a broom, in case you're wondering. Um, in the same way that those yardsticks and those sticks were acting as sort of squeegees, now he's using a found object, which you would certainly recall if you're familiar with Marcel Duchamp's work, because Marcel Duchamp went and bought shovels and hung them up. So it's sort of the same, the same idea in that way. And then you start to see these devices used again and again and again, again, sort of sweeping across the canvas and erasing some of the letters and some of the numbers. And so he's just constantly kind of bringing back these ideas of, of language and process. Now, um, in the work as it gets larger and some of these paintings become very, very enormous, he takes that concept of diver and reintroduces it into multi-paneled paintings that also add these elements of color and letters and forms. So there's the blue, the stencil of blue, here's the device. And then using color or sort of lack of color, he's almost referring to sort of steps that suggest three-dimensional space. So he's really playing around with all of the aspects that you think of when you think of um, of, of, of different techniques of art. Now he has in the show, you'll see this, this is study for skin one. And this is actually, it's very it's interesting. It's actually made by him lying up against the, you can see this is an image of him putting ink on his face and then rolling his face around the canvas. What's fascinating is there's another artist out there named David Hammonds who's been quite getting a lot of attention for doing this. And John's really is the first person to do this, but he's leaving traces of himself. And this also speaks to the whole idea of semiotics and you know, how do you represent yourself? How do you leave traces of things? Uh, so it's very kind of complex. Here's David Hammond, so it, he, he certainly is referencing. Uh, and then this diver, again, as I said, it was referencing, it's very personal reference to um, a friend of his who had died um, and you start to see it get, the work gets very dark. And this is really kind of the moment again, when he's breaking up with Robert Rauschenberg. Uh, and he starts to frequently quote Hart Crane at this moment. Um, and, you know, some of the work goes into a very, very dark place, but you can see the hand of the artist throughout the work as John's is kind of, again, using these mechanical devices, but then also showing the factor, showing the paint in this way. And he said um, this, he said, my, the relationship with Bob, this is him talking about the breakup with Rauschenberg, was extremely important to me as an artist and as a human being. So to end contact with an honest opinion that you're willing to accept, to have it or not, is a huge difference. And I think that, you know, as I said, when you go through the show, I mean, they break in 62. So they have about eight years, seven or eight years together. And then after that break, everything that Johns does refers back to the earlier forms, whether it's targets, numbers, maps, letters, flags. He's constantly kind of re-engaging in those images. And then you, you do see, um, again, some, some fairly powerful pieces. This is him with Diver and with um, Periscope. You could see there's the, um, the use of the, of the mechanism for the device, if you will. And these are works you'll also see in the exhibition. And they, as I said, they constantly self-reference, right? So you can see there's the can, right? The coffee can. 
And you can see that here he's using the stencils to think about red, yellow, blue, thinking about basic color and color theory. And then this sort of, you'll see this, you can turn this on and off. It's sort of like a neon that sort of shines at you. So he's thinking more again about these found objects and constructing forms. Um, very much a part of his practice. And this uh, is a very large piece that you'll see in the show, The World According to What, um, again, bringing all these things in, the colors, the found objects, churning chairs upside down with the idea that a figure is in this piece and the figure has been turned upside down. So The World According to What, Jasper Johns is like is being turned upside down but he's still engaging with art in an incredibly powerful way. And here again, he's paying homage to Duchamp by literally adding these objects on the surface of the canvas as found objects, as, as, as referencing that. Um, and this one, this piece, apparently Johns actually went to Madame Tussauds and got very interested in waxworks and actually made wax pieces to sort of resemble his own body and this idea that he's being turned upside down on the chair after Rauschenberg has left him. So again, as I said, very autobiographical in that way. Now I'm going to jump us based on our time. And again, I is, as I said, there's a lot in the show and there is a lot to talk about. But one of the other things that um, that John's towards the end of his life got very interested in was Edvard Munch and a particular painting that Munch made called Between the Clock and the Bed. And this was a painting that Munch made, it was the last major work of art that he made before he died. And the idea was that he was between the clock and the bed, between life and death, right? The clock, you stand upright, he's still standing upright, but he's about to go into the bed where he lies down and that will be that. And you can see this pattern that Munch made on the bed became something that became very important pattern to John's. And when you go into the show, there is a room after room. There are about two, there's one really fantastic room with this particular slash hash marking um, in very ben, wide, w different ways. But he's, he's really, again, kind of making the eye look all over and look for patterns, look for shapes, look for relationships. Um, but they're really, it's, and it's challenging to do that because the lines are constantly making you rethink and, and, and relook in that particular way. So I'm gonna end with this image, which is called voice. And I really like this image because um, it's again, one of the device paintings. Um, it's from the Manil collection. It has all these found objects, whether it's canvas with wood, string, wire, metal spoons, forks. Um, and I think it's an image that speaks to finding your voice and finding your way. And how has John's, through all of the work that I've shown you, really engaged and embraced with questions, heavy, heavy questions about not only works of art and what it means to be an artist, but what it means to be an American, um, what it means to be someone in a relationship, and he's using his paintings as a voice. So I really do think that how does Jasper Johns find his voice? He finds his voice through his art. So check out Voice when you get there and all of these other paintings. I'm going to stop my share because I've been throwing a lot of super heavy uh, intellectual art history stuff at you, but I'm hoping that you have some questions for me and I, I bet you do. <laughs> well, you've given us all a lot to think about, Paige, and there are a few questions. Uh, one attendee wondered in terms of the medium John's chooses, is it always oil, always acrylic? No, he changed, that's the whole thing. And you'll get this at the show. As I said, when you walk in, it's works on paper. And then when you go into the next room, you have the flags, which are all encaustic. And then you go into another room and it's all oil. And then you have other rooms where he's using, you know, his face rubbed in ink. So, and then he's using found objects. So he's all over the place with materials. And that's one of, I think, the most powerful things about John. So he was experimental. He never felt like he had to sort of be a painter. You know, he wasn't a, he's a painter, 
but he's using so much else other than paint to make these things. He's really, I think more of a, in some ways, he's just a creator, the better way to put it. It's a very good way to put it, Paige. Um, this is going back to the beginning of um, your presentation when you were discussing the flags. Um, one of the attendees is asking, could John's white flag also be a symbol of surrender? I, I like that idea. Yeah, I, I really do. I mean, as I said, that's what I love about these flag paintings, because I think people look at them in the beginning and they say, it's a flag. Like, what is this doing in a museum? This is a flag. I see this all the time. And then the more that you look at it and the more that you think about it and the think of the symbols of the flag. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting that you say that because there's a, we have a show up at the Met right now in American fashion and it opens with a flag made by um, um, Ruby Sterling that's, it's got no color in it. And it's a comment on race, but it's also a comment on the fact that, you know, we all need to come together. So I, as I said, I mean, it, it, it could mean a lot of those things. And I think that it, it, it's, it's something that John starts people thinking about in new ways. I like that idea. I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I haven't actually ever read that, but, but I, I, I think it's good. And that's what John wants you to do, right? He wants you to look at the flag and start thinking about these things other than just walking past it and not. And one of the things I will argue is the more you think about John's and these kind of things, you will stop and look at flags. You will stop and you will look at the flag that's hanging and think about it in a way that you might not have before. And you'll also look at how people appropriate the flag. So as I said, the costume show at the Met, there's a whole series on flags on sweaters like Ralph Lauren and how these different sweaters engage with the flag. And then they're you know, people like Tommy Hilfiger who use the flag and they cut it up and they use it as, you know, clothing. John starts all that. He's the beginning of all that, in my opinion. It's a um, long answer. <laughs> <laughs> to, well, to continue, um, someone else is asking, what would John say about the thin blue line flag? or other flags appropriated by people who see themselves as patriots, yet alter the traditional American flag for their purposes. Well, this is what I think. I think John starts the ball rolling. I think he's the one who gives permission. As I said, in the 1950s, I think people would have taken tremendous pause if they'd seen, you know, even Ralph Lauren putting a sweater, you know, a, a flag right. on the sweater. I think people would have been like, that that was so disrespectful. And so John sort of opens the door to people playing with the American flag. And of course, as you know, when they do, there's a lot of, they're, they're making a lot of political comments behind it, for sure. <laughs> um, just going back to um, something at the end of your presentation, someone's asking what was cage's idea of chance that oh i referenced reference? that very quickly because that's, that's again i'm really giving you like a seminar in advanced art historical theory <laughs> which is why which is why i love john's because he he allows you to discuss it but so um john cage was a great friend of john's and rauschenberg he was sort of the partner of merce cunningham they were all down at black mountain college together and john cage's whole idea was this concept that we're all open to chance and that we should, you know, experiment and see where things take us. And we don't necessarily know what something's gonna look like at the end, we're just gonna let it evolve. And, and he created actually a very famous musical piece um, called 433, where for, for four minutes and 33 seconds, no one played anything. And you just sat there and listened to silence and all these sort of random things happen like, you know, wind blows or someone sneezes. And so what happens when you just don't do the conventional thing and you allow chance to take over? Um, and, and, and Cage is a huge part of this Dada, I, we call it Neo Dada movement where they're reacting against, you know, basic traditional ideas about art making. So that, that's, that's a very brief uh, explanation of that, but Cage is, is, is really critical to John and also to Washington. Yeah. Someone to explore. Yes. Um, yeah. 
Somewhat um, in the middle of your presentation, there was a picture, a target with oh, four target heads with MoMA, the MoMA without target. eyes. And uh, this person is saying the target with the four heads without eyes seem to get more defined with each one as you move from left to right. right. Why do you think John's did that? Well, I would think that what he was trying to simulate was a, was target practice, like shooting at mm -hmm. something so may I, and again i'm not entirely sure but you know when you're shooting you're focusing so you're moving and you get more and more and more focused as you're moving you know down these down these little and again the flap the idea is you know you you if you're in one of those you know those those um, things at arcades where you have the gun and the flaps open and close and you shoot at them sort of a shooting arcade i guess i don't do this very often so i don't have good language about it but the idea really is that you're you're focusing like the whole idea of a target is to get you to focus so the closer you look at the target the more things get in focus and that's the point of a target which is why when he then gets rid of the colors in the target what's the purpose of the target because it's not helping you focus so what's the point so i, I think i think that that may be it but again this is the other joy of these questions um, you know, you never really know. So it, it, but he opens the door to, to investigate all this stuff. Definitely. And someone else is asking, um, say uh, about Lewis Miller. He saw Lewis Miller talk about his flower flashes and some of the ideas he talked about were similar in ways such as the found nature of them and the unexpected locations. He didn't mention John's, but maybe Lewis Miller took in that influence without fully knowing it. Do well, you have? Well, this is my comment on that. And I think, you know, it, 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 like I said, if you really look at what John's did, he kind of opens the door for conceptual art, for pop art, for postmodernism, for, you know, collage and found object. So it, you know, whether it's a it's a recognized one for one reference, it's really he he creates the the basis that we see all this as art, and that artists feel you know comfortable creating those pieces. They they recognize it as art, and people feel comfortable viewing it as art. And as I said, you know, a lot of those kind of things we now don't even question. But it's through the work of John's and I would say Rauschenberg also that um, when some of the things we see in museums now, we don't even, you know, bat an eyelash, but they're the ones that 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 build the build the foundation for it. So, but you can see a lot of John's and a lot of things, which is what's fun. And when you go to the show, you also realize that he's still working, still putting out stuff. I, I have to confess, I'm not really crazy about the recent stuff he did during COVID, which I didn't even allude to. Um, but he he himself is still, you know, participating and in, in the art world. And I, I think that's quite noble at age 92. Yeah, <laughs> 91, 92, but he's 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 getting up there. And I, I also hope that people get a chance to see the show because I really do think it's the last major retro problem. I mean, who knows? He could live another 20 years, but um, it's the last major show for him while he's alive. And uh, I think that that it's, it's, it's definitely worth seeing if you can if you can get there and see it in Philadelphia, too, because they have, uh, you know, an equal number of in, you know, fantastic objects. So it's it's really quite a it's quite a quite a a presentation and a demonstration of the depth and the breadth of his art. Definitely, this has been wonderful, Paige, and certainly, um, I think given everybody a lot to think about. I particularly appreciate the fact that you underscored his relationship with Rauschenberg. Yeah, and that's a big part of, I mean, as I said, I don't, I think the two of them together were forces of nature and the stuff that they were doing, again, it changes the art world. And then they split and neither one of them, I think, ever really, I don't want to say rec they recover and they move on, but that's, you know, quite a, quite a important relationship. Indeed. Well, I can um, let everybody know that you will be back with us after the holidays on January, Monday, January 24th, 
and Paige is going to be bringing the Dior exhibit. <laughs> this is a completely the, different topic. Completely <laughs> different. This is not yeah. cerebral. This is just fashion and fantasy. It's a, it's a 180 from what I do tonight. So if your head is spinning and you're like, this is too much for me, tune into Dior and it'll be beautiful flowers and and, and, <laughs> and, Laurel, and lots of stories about John Galliano. So yeah, it, it's a different, <laughs> very different show. Picked <laughs> after the holidays. <laughs> for sure. Thank Thank you so much. This was fabulous. My total pleasure. Everybody have a wonderful holiday and I hope to see more of you all in 2022. So thanks again. Well, Be well. Bye.